welcome back. We're back again for yet another episode of Kopi with Chris. I'm Chris Hansen. I am super excited today, but before I introduce to you my guests in the studio, I'd like to again thank Kaki for their great coffee and the smorgasbord of sandwiches we have right in front of us. Thank you, Kaki, and everyone ought to go to Kaki. They are located at AMK Hub 53, AMK Avenue 3. Basement 1, Units 51, B and C. Thanks again, Kaki. I just need to get on to the show right now because I have someone with me today who has such an illustrous career and a true son of Singapore's music scene. Please help me welcome Dick Lee. Hi, hi, Chris. Hi, Thank everybody. you so much, Dick, for being here. Uh, you just cannot imagine how excited I am to have you in my studio, man. I just cannot imagine a day will come that on my show I have Dick Lee seated next to me. Okay. <laughs> really, really, really. And you know something? A couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, my producer told me, Chris, guess what? Dick Lee is coming on. I said, no way. He said, yeah, Dick is coming on the show. And you know what I did? I spent the last couple of weeks talking to friends, talking to people outside, asking them, if you had one question for Dick Lee, what uh -oh. would that question be? Uh -oh. And I collated <laughs> it. And you know, and I, I promise you, this is real. Yeah. Everybody came back with this one thing. Most of them. Nine out of ten. And I'm going to ask you this question right now. It's a simple one. It's a the real same, simple they one. They came back with the yeah, same, same question. Same one. I, I kid you not, yeah? They ask, can you please ask Dick, is his name Dick in his birth certificate? <laughs> is it? Well, as you know, Dick is short for penis, right? I was thinking <laughs> Richard, la, you know, yeah, I wasn't okay. going that far. Yeah, but. <laughs> okay, le let me give you the history of why. Okay, my name is uh, Richard Lee. Okay, Richard Lee. So Ping really, Wood. Richard yeah. Lee. Okay. And I was um, named after my grand uncle, who was very close to my father. Okay. And his name was Uncle Dickie. Wow, like Lord Louis Mountbatten. Yeah. But but he was, I don't think he was Richard. He was just Dicky. So they <laughs> said they couldn't just call me Dicky, so they had to call me Richard. Okay. So yeah. actually, your name is Richard Lee. Yeah. And, okay. Maybe. And there, there is a whole generation of people yeah. Yeah. who know me as Richard because until I was, uh, when I was in St. Joseph's Institution, SGI, okay. I was... Called, known by my register name, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, all through my teenage up to 16, I was known as Richard. You mean your schoolmates, the classmates, all yeah, called Yeah, they will Richard. think of me as Richard. Yeah, Richard Lee, the skinny geek. <laughs> <laughs> then oh. how come Dick? How did you become Dick Lee? At least for your, you know, you're synonymous with that. You're famous for that, for being known as Dick Lee. Because, that because my, my at-home name is Dick, Dickie. Okay. I've always been called Dick at home since I was born. Okay. It's only in school that they use Richard. Right. Yeah. But when you decided to be the artist that you are, and you launched your albums, and you had you decided you use Dick instead of Richard. Yes. That's when I went because, uh, okay, I was in a vocal group in school in okay. secondary three and four. Uh -huh. It's mainly secondary four, and. Um, then I was I was uh, the uh, the last member to join a vocal group called Harmony. Okay. And um, then I was known as Richard, right? Right. But after we left school, mm -hmm. um, I went solo. I left the group mm -hmm. and started to perform on my own. Okay. And then I use the name that I'm commonly known as, you know, to friends outside of school. Okay. Then I use Dick Lee. So that's how it happened. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> See, a little bit of history that people don't know about. I just want to bring it out today because so, so many people say, can you just please ask him? Is he known as Richard? And honestly, I was not thinking about <laughs> what you said. Yeah. But you know something? When I go to the US, uh -huh. I, I, I use Richard. Because if you go to Starbucks and they say, oh, what's your name? And you know they call your name when you're... Yeah, your latte, yeah, 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 they do. Dick, like that. So I, I feel sometimes a little... <laughs> okay, Richard. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> dick is quite common in the US anyway. Yeah, but for, you know, they use it like, don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. this is a staple of my show. Mm -hmm. One of my kopi kakis will come on. You're, you're my kopi kaki today. All okay. my guests are known as kopi kakis. Okay, right. so thanks for being my kaki today. Pleasure. Um, and, you know, we start the show by asking our kopi kakis to just take hold of the mic and tell everyone 
Who is Dick Lee in your own mind and what you're all about? Okay, um, I have gone through many uh, phases in my life. I've done many different things, but at the end of the day, the essence of who I am, right. I'm a songwriter. Okay. Yeah, above and beyond everything else, I'm a songwriter. Okay. That's it. That's all you're yeah. gonna say. That's okay. all. That's all I am. Really. You know that if that's all you're gonna say, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to dig deeper. No pun intended. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you take us back? You said you were from St. Joseph's Institution. Yeah. Oh boy, I I, I tell people all the time. You know, now I can easily say this is about episode twenty-eight today with you. Seven out of ten people on my show mm -hmm. seem to come from either ACS, SGI, or RI. Really, seven out of ten. Seven okay. out of ten. Yeah. Seven out of ten. Easily, I can tell you that. And here you have one more RI, uh, SGI guy with me, and I go, oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, you know why? Because you're, you, you must get younger guests. Then I, they will come from more neighborhood schools. You are very right. Yeah. In the last couple of weeks, though, uh, we're into season two right now. And the last couple of weeks, I've been having younger guys, and they all don't come from you exactly, know, the schools yeah. that, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Just so happened that people in the media and entertainment world seem to be coming from SGI, St. Patrick's, you know, a bit of an RI, more from ACS. It's really weird, man. I mean, the people... Especially uh, musicians are mainly from Catholic schools. Yes, right? yes, yes. And in, in my day, I mean, there were, you know, the neighborhood schools were not, not popular. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean... Today they they're saying every school is a good school. But <laughs> yeah. And there were not many. There mm -hmm. were not many. I, I don't, you know. Okay. Yeah. Did you already know back then when you were in school in SGI that you would actually become an entertainer? Okay, no, no, of course not. I mean, when I was um, in school and, you know, exploring music, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the entertainment scene was dead. It was completely dead. Really? This would be early 70s, yeah, because um, it's strange because in the 60s, there was such a boom mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of, of local music yeah. and local bands and everything, and I got inspired, but then that, I was just a kid, right? I was just a child. Mm -hmm. But when, it, when I was a teenager and started to want to make music that whole world had collapsed but you had a you had a calling then when you were say 13 14 years old yeah yeah i guess i did yeah i i saw i learned uh, the piano when i was uh, seven years seven years old already. okay so i started to you know get into music and very fortunately i grew up in a house that had music playing all the time mm -hmm. my father would play jazz my mother would play pop because you know my mother and my dad, the third, they were 13 years apart. Okay. So she would play, you know, very... She was only 20, 21 when I got, was born. Wow. So she would play... Put on the records. Music. Yeah, and then dance, and then my father would play jazz. And so it was like all the time like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I grew up, you know, with music. And um, and then when, when, when I started to get into music by myself, right. um, I was really like... I, I, I'm a kind of person that emulates my heroes mm -hmm. if i like something i want to try and do what they do mm -hmm. and wow, so wow. i started writing songs because i like the the, the the songs i listen to i wanted to become like that like not, the writers not that you said that you know emulating people mm. i said this a couple of episodes ago when fu you know funny enough i was sitting in that seat and divin was sitting in this seat and he was interviewing me okay and um and i had the same answer and it's so strange. Dick Lee is telling me that now, that everything we do, right, we emulate others. Yeah, there's uh, no harm in... You learn by copying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mirroring someone else. Yeah. Okay, who did you mirror? Oh, what my... It, was, were the people in specific that you were mirroring? The, my earliest recollection of uh, wanting to be someone was um, I was fascinated by Disney mm. and, and Disneyland. Okay. And I... I, I wanted to be, I know, I, I tried to read as much about Walt Disney, not just enjoy his cartoons. I was only about 10. Right. But I, I just l was um, so fascinated by this man. Okay. And I still am. If you ask me to name my hero all time, it will be Walt Disney because, you know, he used his imagination and made a whole life out of it. Right. Okay. And, and he um, entertains people from mm -hmm. his imagination. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be like him. And I remember... Uh, somebody went to Disneyland and brought a map of Disneyland back and gave it to me. And 
I built it out of paper <laughs> and plaster <laughs> scene. I built Disneyland. You okay. Know, because okay. I was like, and then um, the other f- that I went on to uh, Enid Blyton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Secret Seven, Famous Secret Five. Seven, yeah. I used to love Enid Blyton books, and then especially the mystery ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I started to, uh, from there, from Enid Blyton, I went on to Agatha Christie. Wow. And then I then I started to love murder mysteries, and then I started to write murder mysteries when I was Did about you? twelve years oh, okay, old. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you know, like, and and then I learned Mozart. I heard that Mozart was a child prodigy, and I wanted to be a child prodigy. So I started to compose like. Did you consider pieces. yourself to be a child prodigy? No, no, no just mucking around at home, lah. <laughs> no, um, so, so you consider yourself to be a regular old teenager then? A f- sort of very uh, rest, creatively restless uh, of kid, lah. You know, like I was always the ringleader of my family okay. and my siblings and cousins. I will organize the game. I will organize activity. So the life of the party, basically. Yeah. I, no, no. I was the controller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the ring, puppeteer. The puppeteer. <laughs> ringmaster, you, if you will. Did you yeah. already feel at that time when you were in your teens that you were already special? I knew that I didn't want to go through the normal route you know, okay. I'm, of life. I mean, and... Uh, Coming from a typical, you know, at that time, uh, sort of middle class family, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, your path is sort of charted up by your parents, you know, and, yeah. you know, and yeah. we were in a period where, you know, I think you, you, you must know, even around your time where success meant only a certain direction. Right. And everybody and our parents who went through the war yeah. want, wanted us to you know, be as successful yeah, as possible. Have a better and, life. Yeah. And do the normal, you know, normal things, get a good education and all that. So, you know, I, I came out of that, but I knew I didn't want to go that way because that would restrict me. Mm-hmm. And by 16, I was always, I was already very uh, creative, very, you okay. know, re- doing lots of things. And I said, what I, what do you want me to do? Go become a what, lawyer or what? what is it, you know, like. So um, what I did was I, I did a very reckless thing when I was in SEC 4. Mm-hmm. I purposely failed my exams. No. Yeah, so I failed my O level, so I could not go any further. <laughs> wow. And so my father was, of course, very disappointed. But you know, basically, I I knew that um, I didn't want to have a fallback plan. Wow. I wanted to be. Th- I wanted to throw myself out there and just struggle and learn and and survive. So what did you do? You 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 you, you screwed up the O levels, right? Deliberately. Yeah. Which I admire you for. <laughs> and then what did you do after that? The first thing that I did was I became an ice skating instructor at Jurong Ice Skating <laughs> Ring. Okay, that was a part-time job. But um, something happened that, that basically it changed my life. Okay, when I was 17, my mother mm-hmm. opened a boutique. Okay. okay. This shop was called Mid-Teen. Mid-Teen. Middle-Teen. Middle-Teen because yeah. she sold clothes for... Twins, like 10 yeah. to 10 to 12, 12 year yeah. olds, yeah. And it was at Tanglin Shopping Center. That time, it was the mall. It was the only mall, <laughs> fashion mall, and you know, like that was the old Singapore Handicraft Center there around. No, that no, area, no, no, is no. It? Tanglin is still there. Yeah, no, Tanglin Shopping Mall, but uh, sh- shopping complex. Tanglin Shop, yeah, Tanglin yeah. Shopping, com- shopping, uh, shopping com- complex, or shopping center, shopping Tanglin center, shopping, shopping center. center. Yeah. So, sorry, yes. Where Steeple's Deli is. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember Tanya used to have a shop. Yes, yes, anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah, that's right. So so she had a shop there. Mm -hmm. And then I started to hang around the shop. And I don't know how I got into designing. I I think earlier on, I used to like to draw fashion. Fashion design. No, draw... Clothes. Girls in clothes. (laughs) Not... I wasn't designing. I was just like drawing... I remember always drawing girls with clothes and they had big boobs. And so I remember my mom, well, my mother was always saying, why are the boobs so big in my... But I used to draw them. And, um, and then when, when, when she opened the shop, I was 16, 17, right? right. And my friends, my, my friends are the convert, you know, mm-hmm. as I say, the, the uh. sluts at CHIJ. Oh my <laughs> Lord. Yeah, so they were... <laughs> And those days we couldn't. My teenagers couldn't buy clothes like now. There was no H and M. There was yeah, know, like yeah. no cheap clothes for kids. Yeah. We all used to tailor, correct, tailor yeah. our clothes. So I started designing clothes for them for mm-hmm. that age group. Okay. 
And that got me, and then that got me into fashion, designing, you know, I then made the clothes, sold it in my mom's shop. And one day, I th- when I was 17 years old, she decided to have a fashion show. Okay. Okay. And this was a charity show at Tropicana, you know, the, oh, yes. yeah, the topless place. Oh. But, but we were in the afternoon, so all <laughs> no the topless. girls were, yeah. No point. Because, bras on, bras yeah, on. Yeah, because you were designing <laughs> clothes, so they'd be clothed up. Yeah, and yeah. they were teenage girls. Okay, uh, okay don't so go there. All right. <laughs> so we did this show. She, I, I did the show for her, designed mm-hmm. the clothes, right? Mm. And I basically put the show together. I choreographed the show using all my friends, mm-hmm. all my Girls, girls the and girls, guys, yeah, yeah okay. from SGI and SEHIJ. Right. And then my singing group f- from SGI Harmony, Harmony. We, we mm. sang, we sang, I wrote songs and we recorded it on a, you know, like cassette player on top of the piano. Right. And then, um, so I did the soundtrack, I choreographed the show, designed the clothes, put the whole show together. Wow. And I was 17 and that told me, okay, this is fun. You know, no one's doing this really. That time, there was no uh, real fashion industry, right? right. And the, the fashion shows were at the very most in Chinese restaurants. They were very, very basic. So I started to produce shows, mm-hmm. like mainly for first for my mother. Mm-hmm. And then my friends, I went, like, they, g- these girls went into university. Right. I started to do their Freshie Queen uh, uh, designs. Design. Uh, no, I produced the Freshie Queen. Oh, okay. Yeah, I choreographed <laughs> the beauty pageant. And then I got I got hit I uh, not hit hunted I got uh, noticed by a model agency. Okay. Elsa Yo Models. Elsa Yo. Yeah. I remember that name. You remember that name? Yes. Because she specialized in beauty queens. Yes. So she found me and hired me to to choreograph her shows. Wow. So before my NS, I was a show choreographer. Sixty dollars a show. So I all remember. this happened yeah. before national service. Yeah. You know. It's amazing. I'm actually seeing this image in my head of a 16-year-old Dick Lee yeah. designing <laughs> clothes, you know, for women who seek up and above. <laughs> <laughs> and no. you actually wrote, you started writing already. Music. Yeah, I was writing songs already. And you, you did it all on your own, self-taught how to write scores. Yes, just, not scores, just songs. Songs, Lyrics okay. and music. Lyrics and music, okay. Yeah. Which means the chords okay. and everything. You're not a Tao Gela. No. But now you write but using no, Tao Gay. No, no, because I did study piano. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm a Tao Gay writer. Call me an ignoramus, <laughs> but I just need to find out. Okay, so you wrote the lyrics, you put the chords to it, and then voila, melody's all there. Yeah. Okay. And basically, when I, when I was writing songs, I mean, mm-hmm. this is a, a parallel to my fashion career, right? Okay. Um, the thing is that my, my group, we, we were singing covers. Mm-hmm. And we were taking part in talent times. We just went, those days, the talent time was the only way you could expose yourself. Yes, yes, yes. I remember those. And yeah. you just went from one talent time to another. Yeah. And they were like professional talent timers, you know. Yeah. They would finish maybe, even if they win. They, they toured it. They did take part in another yeah. talent time. They toured these kind of things. Yeah. And yeah. They, were, they were going on all the time. So we were doing that. But I left the group basically because I wanted to perform my own material. Okay. The only problem was that no one, you know, that that whole world of, no one was interested in original songs at that time. Right. So I carried on. I just carried on writing my songs. And I took my songs and I played in schools, in university, uh, lunchtime. I went everywhere, library. But what did you do for money? Because No, no, I was only a kid. I was only 17. Okay. No need so much money. Okay. And this is the seven, this is 1973, right? Okay. And then eventually I took part, um, and when I took part in Talent Times, I sang my own songs. Okay. Never won. Never even got in. Sometimes audition level out already. Wow. Until one day, I took part in this Talent Time called Ready Steady Folk, and it was um, organized by Ready Fusion. Okay. I went in, I auditioned for it, and I played my own song. Right. And then... There was no one there in the room. There's a voice on the on the speaker. Okay. And he said, "Okay, play your song." I played my song. After I finished, no, no nobody, nothing, no sound. Nobody came out. Okay. Then suddenly there was a bit of noise from the side, and then this guy came out, and he was the one auditioning me. All right. And I said, "Oh my God, it's Vernon Cornelius." Wow. Yeah. Hello, Vernon. Cliff Richard. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "You know, I used to like you know buy your single your <laughs> singles when I was a kid." And he had, because the Quest had disbanded. Yes, okay. And he was a DJ at Rediffusion. 
Was he? I, yeah. I didn't realize that. Okay. And then he said, D- "Did you write that song?" And I said, "Yeah, I did. You know, I mean, it's my song." And he said, "You know, it's very unusual. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I want to put you in this talent time, but you know, everyone is going to sing cover versions. Right. You're not going to fit." So what he did was he put me on as a guest artist, mm-hmm. and I appeared every week. You know those days, talent time got yep. heats, la, la, then the no semi final yep. and all these different different rounds. Right. right. But so you were not a contestant then. You so were just a yeah. guest. You were a guest artist, which was actually elevated already. Yeah. <laughs> because he said then you can come on every week and sing your songs. Awesome. While the judges are d- deliberating, right? So I did that and. Um, the song that I auditioned when I first met him was Life Story. Oh. Yeah, this was a song that to this day I still perform, right? Yeah, I still remember the tune. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then when it came to the finals, because I had been writing songs and my inspiration for all those songs mm-hmm. were, were, were Western artists like Elton John, especially Elton John, right? He was my idol. Oh, okay. So I used to write, if you hear the songs of, the, even Life Story has a bit of Elton John-ish Piano ballad, Western style. This is my life story. Yeah, mm, yeah somewhat. <laughs> a bit lah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, somewhat. I was inspired by, by those songs. Mm. So for, for the final, mm-hmm. I decided to do something that was different. Okay. That was very Singaporean. Okay. So I decided to do a song about Singapore. All right. And I thought, what? You know what? What can I write about Singapore? What's the most Singaporean thing I, I know? Yeah. And the first thing that came to mind was Singlish. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that came to mind was food. Okay. So I wrote this song called Fried Rice Paradise. Yeah. And I performed it. Yeah. At the final, and the judge who was um, a record company executive from EMI. Okay. Who whose name is Ross Funnel. Okay. No, Ross Barnett. Okay. And he... Um, EMI Records. EMI Records from England, mm. right? And he's a British and he, 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 he came backstage and he said, you know, I've never heard anything Singaporean <laughs> since I've been here and I work in a record company. And then he uh, signed me to EMI. He said, would, how would you like to have a contract? Wow. So that was my first break. But the, the two I- ironic things happened. The first was that he, t- he took me to uh, EMI Studios, uh, EMI Record Company, mm-hmm. rather, where the boss was Reggie Verghese, mm. which was uh, Colin Cornelius' uh, band, former bandmate, right? Okay, he was I like heard the name Reggie Verghese, yes. So he was running uh, EMI at the time. Right. And basically, well, not Reggie per se, but the company rejected me because they said there's no point in having a local singer. Local, singing original songs, who cares about that? You know what they want is Tracy Huang singing cover versions, mm, right? Mm. So, um, so they dropped me. Okay. But this guy, Ross, he was so angry and adamant, he quit at EMI <laughs> and then he funded my album wow. with his own money. Wow. And that's how I got my first album, Life Story. Wow. And the second ironic thing that happened was I recorded Fried Rice Paradise uh-huh. and it, it was released and the local government radio station banned it. They banned my album. SBC, RTS or SBC? RTS, RTS. RTS. Yeah. And why? Why the heck because, did they do that? Especially for Fried Rice Paradise. They right. ba- because they banned it because um, they felt that the English, no, was not oh, good. the Singlish was bad. Though we cannot promote Singlish. So... Out it went. But luckily, my I, I was discovered on Rediffusion. Mm. And Rediffusion is not government. Yeah. So Rediffusion played it. That's, that's why I love I podcasts. Them. Same damn thing. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> yeah. How did you feel about that when, 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 when RTS ref- can, you know, refused to play your song and because it was Singlish? How did you feel about that? It was very confusing because I thought, hey, I want to do something that's original, that's Singaporean, yeah. right? Yeah. And yet, being Singaporean, what the impression I got was, is no good. Don't show your Singaporeanness. Hide it. Because we're maybe still a British colony, were we at that time? No, not No, not of course not. No, yeah. no, no, <laughs> yeah. no way. But there was this leftover of, a, you know, like, you know, we must be better than... Just yeah, I know, so, I yeah. know. But you know, I'm going to... 
I'm supposed to, because you know, I, you know, all the respect for you and your fans. Um, I'm not supposed to be be colorful in my language. They okay. could almost blurt it out. So, Chris refrain, because <laughs> it's darn, darn stupid. Frankly, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, look, I don't blame. It's just the way it was at that time. We were still is. Uh, <laughs> it's better now. It's better now. Uh, I think it's slightly better, but. The point is that... That's being polite. <laughs> no, but that was a very interesting lesson for me. Okay. Because it made me strive to find this Singaporean thing that was correct, that was the right thing. Did you, did you, did, do, do you feel that you did, that you eventually did find it? Uh, yes, yes. It, it took a while, but yeah. It took me also going to Japan, going abroad to okay. see myself from... To see Singapore from overseas, right? That you know helped me define. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stop you there. First of all, cheers, mate. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I've almost Let's finished. Waste the coffee. This is a delicious coffee, by the way. Mm. Great stuff, Kaki. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Um, I'm just gonna go back again in time. I'm not gonna bring you forward yet. Okay. And bear with me, okay? I mean, just wanted to before you continue. All this was all before my NS. Yeah. I'm was I'm gonna go to the NS bit soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> but let's go back to SGI for a while. What was school life like for you? You know your relationship with your schoolmates. You know, were there any challenges as an SGI boy? Because I know you know St. Patrick's guys, SGI guys, culturally were kind of like. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 were there any challenges you faced when you you know with schoolmates, classmates? First of all, um, I was a real nerdy guy. Okay. okay. I was a nerdy guy that wanted to be cool, <laughs> you know. And and I, you know, the, the nerdy guys in my class, I mean, my class was all sort of like yeah. the more serious, uh, hardworking boys, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. Because in your class, I know, I know for a fact that the Flying Dutchman was your classmate. Uh, that was a bit late. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, he was. So he's a smart guy. He's a smart, <laughs> he's a smart. Look at him now. Oh, he's successful. No, hey. no, no. He he was, uh, he was, okay, you know, in um, school, right? There are all these, like, I was in Arts 4, which is the first of the arts class. But all the cool guys are in Arts 12, you know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And they are the ones that, you know, like, um, like really have all, uh. Hey, FD, you smart guy, <laughs> yeah, huh? Yeah. Smart guy. Yeah, he's a smart guy. <laughs> he was not in uh, Arts 12. <laughs> but I wanted to hang out with, with, with the Arts 12 guys, but of right. course they wouldn't accept me. Uh. Okay. But the thing that changed everything for me was uh, the fact that um, I knew a lot of convent girls because of my sister. Well, the guys ought to love you, man, yeah. for that. And I had a... So my thing, the thing that broke the ice for me was uh, my 14th birthday. Mm-hmm. It was my first uh, self party, you know what I mean? Like yeah, organized yeah. with my sister and my relative. I have a niece. Actually, she's older than me, but she is by rank a niece. And um, then they brought the girls. I brought all the guys. And okay. I invited some guys. And then after that, yeah, I was a hit. Because uh, you know, I had, I had, I knew all these uh, these girls, and so I started to hang out with them. You know, the guys. Are, I remember back in the day when I was in my teens, and then you've got girls around you, and you always have girls around you. Yeah. The guys will give you a kind of an appointment, and the appointment is called GSO. What is that? It's so, it's so, it's so terribly sexist, but girl <laughs> people did girl supply officer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're like that, I was a GSO man. <laughs> <laughs> and your best friends all of a sudden around uh, yeah, you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. You went into the army after that. Where did you serve? Don't mind me asking, man. Okay, so this is a funny thing. I was like, okay, I've got to do NS, and I went to train, and I went to... Um, I brought my rifle cleaning rod, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I went on the... What do you call that day? Enlistment day? Uh-huh. And that, that time it was at CMPB, CMPB. right? Mm-hmm. So I went in went in line up and did all the things and then when they did my form and all that then they gave me back the form so okay come back tomorrow mm-hmm. i said oh okay i thought everyone goes in the tree tunnel and yeah. gets shipped off no you don't have to to do bmt i said but i tr- i got a rifle cleaning <laughs> rod <Yeah. laughs> i was kind of shocked and disappointed because i was mentally psyched for it i went jogging i did all of that uh-huh. but it turns out that at that my, my eyesight was too bad 
So oh, okay. I became like uh, those days it's called five B E like pass E. Okay. The lowest yeah, possible okay. uh, medical uh, downgraded. Yeah, downgrade yeah. rank. Medical downgrade. So for all of us, we don't have to do uh, BMT. Okay. And we don't have to do reservists either. Wow. Yeah. Damn <laughs> so, so I was uh, suddenly found myself in, um, you know. Senang job. Yeah, senang job. But, you know, like I was in a, a cl- admin. Clerical. Like clerical. Mm. And the next day I went in and uh, fall in. We all stood. And then there we are, all, all of us mm-hmm. uh, physically unfit. Mm-hmm. And there I was like, you know, I'm pretty normal looking. And then next to me, guy got hunchback. Another mm-hmm. wife, one leg shorter, <laughs> one arm shorter. I can't bite one, you. <laughs> one midget, you know. <laughs> all the pipe uh, uh, All <laughs> like so funny, like a, a funny lineup. And then there I was like. One normal looking guy. Yeah, normal looking, <laughs> but with a, with a Coca-Cola bottle glasses. Lah, no way, really? Yeah, my eyesight was like almost 2,000 degrees on each each side. At wow. So if it dropped my glasses, I'll shoot you. Lah. So yeah, you cannot, <laughs> cannot put me in the army. So I ended up um, there. Ended up there was so boring because uh, my job, my unit, mm-hmm. you know the, you know the eleven S. They call eleven B. Yeah, the, the, the IC, right? The IC, yes. In those days, it was handwritten. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, not typed out, and we had. I was the one that had to write everybody's. <laughs> oh, what I'm Fill it up, <laughs> and we have to write in the same way. So we have to do like primary school A, 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 B, 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 like that, just so that we all have the same handwriting. Oh Lord! I was. You were bored out of your mind. And I thought two years of this. And you really did that for two years. No, right? then I lunchtime I walk around and then I discovered music and drama company, which was just MDC, which was there also. Okay. So I was walking, you know, my lunch break, and uh-huh. then I heard this singing, and then I went in, and I auditioned eventually and got in. So I did my NS in, in MDC. MDC. Yeah, wonderful. Even as a recruit, I was in MDC, so that was fun. I was supposed to be in MDC. My damn unit didn't, didn't want to let me You're go. You're too fit. You're too fit. Mm. <laughs> Quite the opposite, uh, yeah. but never mind. Um, you, you did an interview um, not too long ago. And you spoke about a particular tumultuous time in your life. It's got to do with drugs. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. Is that okay? We talk about that. That was more in school. La. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. What <laughs> kind of drugs were you into at a time? Um, you know, those days, right, you could buy drugs in school. At the tuck shop in recess, there were people really? were selling you little joints, you know, of, mm. you know, ganja. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, Sounds and, so fun. Yeah. And and the thing is that <laughs> it didn't feel illegal. Okay. That was the problem we had in uh-huh. Singapore at that time. And that's why NS and the big cleanup of our, you know, yeah. population. I mean, because drugs were so rampant, you could buy anywhere. And opposite SGI, Waterloo Street, a yeah. Sarabat stall, yeah. you could just go there and, you know, like have a coffee and a joint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, hey, think about it. Sounds now like that ho- is legal. Sounds like Amsterdam, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now American, America is yeah, legalized. Right? So, yeah, it's How do you feel about that? How do you feel about it being legalized now? I mean, you know, the problem is that there will always be people who abuse it. So okay. that's the danger. I mean, so did you ever see that as a problem back then when, when it was all so freely r- available? No. You don't see it as a problem? Yeah, I don't know why. Because what was more of a problem was... Uh, Rock music, that was like, rock concerts were banned, you know. Yeah, okay. So we, I used to jam in a band, you know, play Deep Purple and all that. Yeah. Sure, secretly, man. secretly in a oh. basement in a, you know, music studio in Newton. But don't tell my parents. Don't tell them you play guitar because... Wait a second, wait, <laughs> let me get this right. Because this is the first I'm hearing. Rock music was banned. Rock concerts were But banned. not the music though. You could still buy the records. You could still listen to Deep Purple, yeah, right? Yeah, you could. But you could, right? They didn't encourage it. And and also because, you know, the look of, you know, you have the long, long hair, hair, you have play rock, you should take drug run. Okay, so you're saying that how it was seen was that if you were into rock music, chances are you're going to be on drugs. Yeah. So, But you, you see smoking a joint, for example, as a problem back then. Was it? Do you think it's it was it's, it's harmful? Something like we did, I don't know. It didn't feel wrong. Mm. It didn't feel even dangerous mm. because it was like kind of rampant. I won't say that. Well, certainly the people, the boys in my sect, two, us yeah. four, did not 
smoke joints. Okay. And that's why I went down to <laughs> Art 12. 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they had access. And and after that, uh, you know, after that famous party that launched me into society in school. Yeah, yeah. My, that was 14. My 15th birthday, it was a kind of drugged out orgy in my house because uh, my parents um, house then was uh, you know had a big garden okay a big garden dark for fondling perfect perfect, man, <laughs> yeah, perfect. <yeah. laughs> and you know like in the morning there would be that bottles of water my mother said, what what is what why all these bottles of water i think you know <laughs> yeah i are, know okay. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah all like here and there and you know tissue Mm. <laughs> <laughs> tissue paper here all oh in the garden God. because we had a big garden big big garden and uh, so that that already one year on it became it was like shucks like man that, I should have been yeah. a teen in the 70s <laughs> yeah wow but so if you wanted that you had that you know mm -hmm. and, you, and um, the other thing which, which is so different now and I see I was 14 uh, no no 15 let's say uh, yeah 14, 15 I was clubbing mm-hmm with the convent girl, you know, convent girls, and we would go, we would go to nightclubs. Right. And and look at fourteen year olds today have no pubic hair. So I don't know how they. <laughs> I mean, what? Why? Why is it that they don't? They haven't grown up. They they don't seem to have grown up. Okay. Or, or something has happened now that. In terms of maturity, is coming later. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? I don't know. I've not seen yeah. a fourteen year old. Walking around with, with his underwear off, but <laughs> no, but they look I like know. they look like children. <laughs> okay, they look like they look they we look more club. cherubim than than we used to look like. We were more rough and rugged, I would suppose. And the girls would be putting on their makeup and heels, mm. and you know, like yeah. going out. No, they're more subun subun, huh? Yeah, they are yeah, very like, like uh, prim and proper, developed or something, <laughs> or the slow slow developers, or maybe. And I think it's. Um, I think it's because when I was 14, I think yeah. my parents uh, let me be. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember my mom found my cigarettes. Oh, I used to smoke. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also used to smoke. It's fine. Yeah. I, I, I still do. Okay. Peer pressure. Peer <laughs> pressure. And she found cigarettes in a bedside drawer, like hidden. And then mm -hmm. um, I noticed she found them because they were gone. Right. But then the next day, they were back. So... I <laughs> but I counted how many <laughs> sticks. <Did you? laughs> no, but actually she t spoke to my dad and she said, "No, let it be. He'll grow mm -hmm. out of it. Don't don't control him." And you did grow out of it. Uh no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But I did I did quit eventually. La. I mean, I'm yeah. not now. But yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so she let me be, and now the parents, I think, they control their kids so much that the kids are afraid to express themselves yeah. or you know or maybe now the drug problem is so much more severe i mean if they get into drugs it's crystal meth yeah yeah these are the heavy that, stuff yeah. yeah so those but days you know the un recently they, they, they they've taken cannabis out of uh the, the danger uh, as a dangerous substance yeah and of course the singapore government uh are uh, uh, not too happy about that what's your take on this do you think it's I don't think it's a dangerous substance. That's why I think, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I went through a kind of a period with it. You know, not heavily, but, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's just so social sometimes. Yeah. But I never got into, the other thing that was around in my time was right. um, heroin. Mm. I think it was the injectables. Yeah. Injecting. yeah. In, so that's what I knew existed. And, that was and, dangerous. And uh, grass, you know, that mm. was all that that you could get. I think yeah. maybe at that time there were not a lot of mm. a lot of things like ecstasy and all that didn't, like, didn't yeah. come. Meth and, ex and, and meth and, all and later, ice yeah. and ecstasy and stuff. What, so when you you know you, you you write music, you start you play the piano, you sing. I mean, that's a lot la, in my mind. It's a lot. It is <laughs> like come on, dick. It's a lot, really. I um, mean, you play the piano. If you, I mean, you want to sing, you can't sing a cappella, so you play piano or guitar, what? A yeah. lot of people do that. Sure, but it is not, <laughs> when, when you have, especially when you write songs, you know, you're, you're, you've written songs very successfully. Um, not many people who play the piano can even do that, but you've done that. I can only think of Iskandar Ismail, the late Iskandar Ismail, the yeah. great Iskandar Jr. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do in the least. So of all these things that you've done and are continuing to do, 
did anyone teach you or even this or, or did anyone mentor you? Is there someone that you really learned something valuable from in your life that contributed to all this? Besides you emulating people, besides the great guy from EMI who quit and then funded <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Ed know? Vernon who gave me the chance. Ah, Vernon yeah. Cornelius, yes. Dear Vernon, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, funny, I've never had a mentor because I think I, I went through a lot by myself. I mean, my parents didn't understand right but i would say that um my mother just supported me all the way and believed in me without actually saying so i think that made a big difference mm. having knowing that there's somebody believing believing in, in me not financially or anything but just you know when i was like um drop out of school and my father yep. was so disappointed and right. i spent a lot of my career to make him proud because you know i knew he was totally disappointed in me but well i i i done that i i've done that i've achieved that because he actually told me so but um i would say i have had one one person who taught me something and uh, this person was um a lecturer in in so eventually i did go to the uk okay. to study because my father said you know after ns you got to get some qualification so i said okay i'll only do it if it's something i like like okay so i went to do i did fashion design you know in the uk yeah. okay and so we have these things this this subject called complementary studies which is uh like once a week we study something that's outside of fashion okay and and there was this teacher this, mm -hmm. this old guy and i used to spend time with him talking to him playing piano with him and all that in lunchtime and all that mm -hmm. and he would talk to me uh, outside of the the, the, the the actual lesson, lesson time, time yeah. yeah, and he taught me something very very valuable, mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically he said that you can't. Um, first of all, we were talking about how to s look at ourselves objectively. Okay. Okay, and that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, yeah, you can say just step out of yourself and look at who you are and what you're doing, and then you can mm -hmm. you can have a clearer sense of what whether you're doing something wrong or not. Sure. But he said that you can't do that. You can't be self. Um, you have to be. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to be really. There's no self-respect without self-honesty. This is something that he taught me that I've lived by. You know, up okay. to this day. It's just um, I can't respect myself if I'm not true to myself. Can I ask you that period in your life? What about what year was this? This would be uh, late 70s. Because, you know, what happened one day, after about a year of knowing him, he dropped dead at the railway, the train station, right outside the school, and he died. Yeah, so that even, <laughs> I don't know, wow. made it more and more poignant for me. Yeah, but um, what, what, how, what it has taught me is that um, to be, to see, you know, because we always fool ourselves, Mm -hmm. about a lot of things we tell ourselves we are not hurt but we are hurt like mad deluded but, yeah we delude ourselves yeah. and we avoid a top uh, facing the truth sure okay and another thing uh, linked to that is that you can never find an answer if you don't know the question right and we are hiding the question all the time we are hiding the question because we don't want to i'm beginning to understand this a bit more you know later on towards the end of the show You'll understand the reason why I asked you when. You'll understand the reason why I'm very more, very taken in by just exactly what you just said to me. Mm. I'll explain to you. We'll get, there'll be more clarity as we go along. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, now I understand. But anyway, it's a good thing to do because then you can be, you can move on. Yeah. A lot of times we can't move on because yeah. we are holding ourselves back with all the lies we're telling ourselves. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to talk more about how about songwriting? Mm -hmm. How long does it usually take you to write a song back in your early years when you first started writing as compared to today? When I started writing, I had no agenda. Okay. I just write, wrote because I felt sad. I wrote, I felt happy. I wrote a song. And there was just like a way to express myself. And okay. there was no audience. There was no, nobody asked me to write. I mm -hmm. just wrote, and I wrote a lot, you know. Okay. Um, and now it's become professional. I, it's my career, and yeah. 
and I work, I write for the music industry, mm -hmm. and the music industry as I know it, you know, that, that the music industry that I can be part of is like not really for me. I'm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah, a it's whole different world now. Yeah. And I used to, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but most of the majority of the songs I've written are in are the Chinese songs, are in the Chinese market. Thousands of songs I've written wow. for the Chinese market. Okay. Compared to a handful in the <laughs> English, English songs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the Chinese market, again, it's, it's a different situation now mm -hmm. before. You know, you can have a heavenly king, a superstar who can sell lots of albums and all that. But now, you know, it's all downloaded. You don't get your money and you don't get a good advance for yeah. songwriting. Yeah. So I only write to order. I, I write on commission. I okay. find that better. Okay. Because uh, somebody needs the song for a purpose sometimes. And, and you do that with a deadline in mind. Yeah, and even a pub, uh, uh, you, you, you even have a subject given to you. Right, you know, wow. You, you're given a theme, you're given a sort of like some in inspiration, what so they want. Like National Day, for example, I need, hmm. is that like sanctioned on you, asked to do, and then this is the theme, and this is well, how you're going to write it? No, you don't. You're, you're, but you know it's a National Day song, so what the hell? What else can you do? <laughs> I mean, you got, you know, only so many words rhyme with poor. <laughs> you know that so I've I've used them all already, so uh, yeah, it's something like that lah. You know when you write a national day song, you know that it has to be a certain way. Yeah, did you it must have been quite a, a pressure for you huh, doing that for the nation. I could no. imagine the pressure Iskandar had before. It's a little different uh, because Iskandar, I mean. People like Iskandar, okay, mm. they were part of the creative team, right. okay. So they have, the creative director has more of the pressure mm. because the show depends on him. Okay. And then the other people that support him um, just have to support his vision. Right. Right. So it's less of a pressure okay. because, you know, uh, the bigger pressure, I've been creative director five times. Yeah. That, that's the thing that you have to make sure that, you know, Auntie Uncle from Topayo also enjoy the show mm -hmm. and their millennial brats will also want to watch it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so this is a, you, you have to please everyone and that's hard. Wow, the last <laughs> bit there with the millennial brats. <laughs> yeah, Whoa. They're, they're not gonna, they're, they are the one, the most vocal against and, you know, National Day and things like that, right? Yeah, funny, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, so funny. you, but you still have to make it cool then yeah. when you write a song that's too hip auntie uncle don't get it right okay. you, you, you've seen that problem yes you got the, the balancing act is a bit difficult it's there. really tough yeah. that's the pressure and you know the whole nation is watching and waiting to be entertained and yeah. feel something and all yeah. that so that like that like. can you school me in something what um when you start writing a song what's your process like what comes to your head first lyrics words feelings a tune, a melody, what, what happens? So in the last six months, something has happened to me, strange, strange thing. Because I had lots of time, I was at okay. home, you know, so I started writing songs just because I was bored or because I feel like writing a song. Okay. And it, at first when I sat down, I thought, hmm, what shall I write about? <laughs> because nobody <laughs> asked me to write anything. <laughs> like, you know, it's not for any, it's not yeah. for like, you know, P.U.B.'s yeah. anniversary or something. <laughs> you know. By the way, I have written P.U.B.'s anniversary. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but, so I thought, what do I feel? And then I started to write from my feeling, okay? So I, f the feeling, uh, the feeling is the first thing that gets translated mm -hmm. into the piano. Okay. So it's a music first. So it's a melody first. It's, a, it's not so much a melody. It's it's a chord structure. The chord structure. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm happy, I'll write a happy chord. You know, then right. if, if suddenly it starts with a minor chord, then it becomes a bit moody right. and or whatever, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then it builds from there, and then when I hear how it turns out, sort of the song becomes about that mood. Okay. It, whether it's reflective or whether it's. Uh huh. Uh, celebratory or whatever so mm -hmm. you know but as a for someone to be a good songwriter his knowledge of chords has got to be really wide isn't it 
Yes. You got to know your 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 diminishes, your augmented, your flattened fives. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, but you don't like me. I don't even know what they're called, but they, I know that they, I know how to play them. <laughs> okay. You know, like, um, but it would help, right? If you just know three chords, you're just gonna write yeah. the, the same song. But sometimes the best songs, in my opinion, would be four or five chord songs, man. Yeah. I Isn't mean, it? so yeah, but yeah. I think uh, <laughs> let's say that you know, if you are if you want to paint abstract art. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm you would paint it better if mm-hmm. you could paint figurative art first. Okay. Because, you know, abstract art is technically an abstraction of the fi- figurative. Right. So all, all the artists that do abstract art, that paint in abstract style, mm-hmm. they can paint beautiful figurative work. Mm. They all did in the in the yeah. early days, right? Yeah. So you've got to have the foundation. Mm-hmm. It's like someone told me before, if you want to play good drums or even good guitar, learn jazz first. And everything comes into place. Well, that's that's someone. Someone said this to me years and years but piano ago. Piano is so hard to learn. <laughs> jazz <laughs> piano, yeah. jazz piano. Forget it. I so the likes of that. Jeremy Montero, no, uh, I mean, yeah, really yeah. awesome, huh? Yeah. yeah. And um, I remember I watched you on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken, and you actually gave a story about how you wrote "Home." Mm-hmm. It was it wasn't in Singapore when you wrote that song. No. Yeah, you were away. Where were you? Um, I was living in Hong Kong ah. yeah, at that time. And uh, the thing was that, um, you know, Home wasn't written for NDP at all. Okay. It was written for the Sing Singapore campaign. Okay. And th- the campaign was to promote people to sing Singapore mm-hmm. songs. Nothing to do with NDP. Or, and they were running this campaign from about the mid-90s mm-hmm. every year. And then they put together songs... Uh, like try to create a Singapore songbook. Right. And for example, Fried Rice Paradise was also included. So they finally allowed it. Uh. Yeah, yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. And then, so I wrote this, uh, s- there was a call for songs and like a kind of competition. They invited like five, five, six composers to submit a song for 1997 Sing Singapore campaign. Okay. And the theme they gave, my, they gave us was the river, Singapore river. Okay. So we were supposed to write a song about Singapore River. Okay. So I was in Hong Kong. I wrote a song about... Because if you look at the lyric of home, the river. Yeah, the river. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and I was homesick because I had been away already for seven years, living in Japan. And I just moved to Hong Kong that year. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that song and it won. Mm -hmm. Um, And from there, uh, the, the, the... one of the committee members, the judging committee, was the chairman of 1998's NDP. Okay. The military guy, right? Yeah, yeah. So he liked it so much, he put it in. Yeah. 98. And it became a mainstay. But it ca- it was uh, featured in NDP 1998, mm-hmm. not as a theme song. Yes. As an entertainment item. Right. But 1999, they introduced the theme song. Yeah. Concept. So from then on. Yeah, it be, it, it, it's 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 a staple now for Singapore. It's strange that it, you know, it's like it's a beautiful song, mate. Uh, but but it's like never meant to be, you know. I know, and it's from the heart, lah. And it's twenty one years old, lah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, twenty one years that. ago, so it's it's still being. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. Yeah, you should be. Every reason to be. Circuit breaker, especially during the circuit breaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you know something? Yeah. I was on my balcony, okay? <laughs> well, you, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and my neighbors, everyone around me, yeah. and we're all singing the same song. Thank you. And that, uh, I that's think my g- that's my retirement money. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it was a lovely gesture uh, at a time when we were all locked in. Mm. You know, uh, it was it was. Lovely, it really was. A lot of us actually started doing things like that, you know, for everyone else. I did a recording at home. Uh, yeah, for, the, for SAR Association, uh, we had a show that we, we dedicated to um, all the frontline workers. Mm. So I sang, and we recorded it at home, and then they played it. You know, everything came out. Uh, uh, the, it was the first ever virtual show, actually. First when, ever. when was this? This was in uh, April. Oh, okay. Mm, it was in April, when the Circuit Breaker was so going So you're on. a singer? I sing, sing as well. Oh, yeah. that's good. You yeah. have a nice deep voice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, coming from you, 
I mean, look, I, I, I envy your voice. I'm chipmunk. I, but you, you have such a nice, uh, rich voice, speaking voice. Also. Thanks so very much. It means a lot to me. So I thought you were a radio DJ. I mean, like, you know, you have the kind of voice that could be on radio. Sometimes they just happen to miss people like me, like, you know, <laughs> when you have people with bad days, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> why don't you just why don't you poison Flying Dutchman and take over his role? No la no la. <laughs> they're all my friends. You know, Glenn, F D, Divian, Andre, they're all friends. So why John. did you never go into that? Because that would seem a natural for you, I would uh, uh, well it's uh, well it's that's a long story, man. All right, you know? okay. It's a long <laughs> story. I was supposed to. Uh, uh, okay. but something happened. But I'm happy, as a mm-hmm. matter of fact, uh, because I really love doing this. This is mm-hmm. something I've dreamed. This is special, yeah. It is, yes, it is. Thank you for saying that, too. Now, but you know, mm-hmm. I want to just r- recap the yeah. whole idea. I mean, since before we move on from sure. home is that, you sure. know. Um, I would say that my, my journey begins with Fried Rice Paradise and ended with home. Why do you say ended? You're not done, because are I f- you? No, I mean my search. And okay. So that because I was I started looking in yeah. 1973. And you know, it took you so many years. To actually find the thing that, um, that in fact, it came naturally. I uh-huh. did not write home specifically to answer that question. Yeah. The Sing- Singapore pu- people answered it for me. Yeah. By singing it for the last 21 years. So, we, so, so it they have shown me that. that this is the, uh, you know, this is a Singapore song. Yeah, the, it is. The, the, the song I've been looking for my whole life, sort of. Wow. But it is, yeah. frankly speaking, my favorite. Thank you. <laughs> really, it is. It brings a tear to everyone's eye. Thank you. And that's true. I mean, I'm a, I'm also, I like to think of myself as a, as a very frank Singapore son. You know, I, I like to think of myself that way. Uh, politics aside. <laughs> that's a good actually at this point I normally the interview ends <laughs> uh, normally but uh, no but this is a podcast you know sometimes you just oh, go okay, a bit okay. a bit more left um, <laughs> as an artist you've, you've heard a few people several people sing home of all these which one's your favourite version I put you like in the spot put you in the spot <laughs> <laughs> it's like saying which is my favourite child not, uh, uh, I mean you know, it's, it's so many people have sung it and they're all different interpretations. And yeah. Which is your favorite interpretation? Um, mine. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody good yeah. answer, yeah. I do it at all my shows. So, and, yep. Damn good answer, man. <laughs> really, that's, that was a damn good answer. I'm not going to pursue any further. <laughs> Let's talk about your upcoming show. Okay. The more further adventures of Dick Lee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. That's cool. That's cool. I say again, coming up soon, the more further adventures of Dick Lee. And it's the <laughs> first live show, huh? Since uh, Phase 2, isn't it? The first concert, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, live concert. Yeah. How do you pull that? How do you pull uh, that Because I, I'm, I'm part of, a, I'm Associate Artistic Director of the Singapore Repertory Theatre. Okay, SRT. And they have, the SRT has an actual physical theatre. So yes. Mm-hmm. Um, they now can have an audience, but, you know, they, they don't have many productions. And mm-hmm. normally around this time, uh, January, February, is their fundraiser. Mm-hmm. So in place of a, a gala dinner, you know, right, so right. we're doing this okay. sort of like to raise funds for them. Okay. In the promo, mm. uh, you put out one of the most iconic albums in Singapore's music history. We're saying it. We're saying it. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, on it were some of your biggest hits like Rasa Sayang and Mustafa. Yeah. Which is your favorite track from that album? From that album, I would say The Mad China Man. No. Yeah, The Mad China Man. The yeah. Mad China yeah, Man, it's your the favorite last track. track on the yeah. Album, yeah. Okay. Um, the Did show, The More Further Adventures of Digley, covers your time working in different parts in Asia in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where did the idea to do a show about this come about? Um, you know, I have done, um, after a very, very long break, mm-hmm. my first show mm-hmm. was in 2011. Okay. After many years. Okay, I was away all the 90s. Mm-hmm. I came back in nine, uh, 2001. I came okay. back to Singapore. Okay. And then I was a little bit lost. I had I spent a bit of 10 years, like the 2001 to 2010, okay. floating around. 
uh, doing a bit of no. I only I did one NDP. I did. I went back to fashion. You know, I that's I not was, floating around. Yeah, no, but I was really kind of like, <laughs> oh, who am I? What am I doing? What? Should, and then there was no music <laughs> coming out of me and everything. So, um, I sort of found myself again in uh-huh. 2011 uh-huh. when I did a small show at the Recital Studio at okay. Esplanade called "The Adventures of the Mad Chinaman," and I told the story of from my my childhood up to 1989 when okay. I did the Mad Chinaman. Right. So it's the story of how from Fried Rice Paradise to Rasa Sayang, you right. know, like that, that, that journey. Mm. And that show was um, very successful, sold out. It's yep. a small theater though, but um, I repeated it that year. And then in 2015, I did it again in the Esplanade. Okay. You know, Esplanade Concert Hall. Yeah. So this is... This takes a story from what happened, what from 1990 onwards. Okay, yeah, so it's so a continuation. It's a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, of your life throughout yeah. the 90s. Yeah. Right. Up to yeah, sort of like up to home and. So what can we expect from the show? Um, it's basically the format is you know the where where I'm most comfortable. Uh, I will be at the piano, playing, talking. With a big Steinway. A big, my, my big Steinway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be playing with my big Steinway. <laughs> Is he German? <laughs> <laughs> made, okay. in, made in China. I <laughs> uh, cannot say that. I'm a Steinway artist, so there's the best pianos in the world. Okay. <laughs> and okay. then, you know, I'll be showing some pictures. And, you know, it's, it's going to be like a bit of... Nostalgia. Uh, nostalgia, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, and, and talking and singing and just me and the piano. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Okay, everybody, look out for this. The more further adventures of Dick Lee, get your tickets. Make sure you get your butts there, yeah? I'm going to ask for your opinion this time. All of us entertainers, we're going through the most difficult time ever. Right. How did you overcome this trying period to get a live show approved? Um, the, the way, you know, when, when everything opened up and the opportunity, be, I mean, when, when doing a show became possible, um, I jumped at it, you know, I, I offered it to SRT. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have, they, they are having a show running now, a play called, uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Mm-hmm. Um, they opened with this play, 60 performances sold out, you know, mm-hmm. so. I, I realize that people are just dying to go out. Yeah, hell yeah. Be entertained, yeah. Everyone's COVID fatigued. Yeah, and they've done it very nicely. When I went to watch it, mm-hmm. it's um, they took out lots of seats. So the seats are basically positioned in pairs. Okay. With a little table and a lamb. And it feels like... You cozy, know, cozy, but social distancing observed. Yeah, like a kind of bar almost. You know? Wow, wow, nice, nice, Yeah, nice. so um, I thought, yeah, this is actually perfect for kind cool, of man. piano show. Like oh, like, yeah, yeah, piano, jazz, piano kind jazz, of... Yeah, You know, of kind of, thing, of feel yeah. is cool. Okay. So where can Singapore... <laughs> people in Singapore... Singaporeans, where can they go to buy a ticket to watch the show? Cystic. Okay, people. <laughs> it's on Cystic. Go to Cystic, yeah? They're this only, is where you can do it. There are only six shows, huh? January 19 to 24. January 19 <laughs> to 24th. <laughs> six shows only. And six shows. Only nine, uh, 40, uh, 50, 40, 92 seats. 92, 92 seats. seats. Per Singapore, show. Singapore, you better listen to <laughs> this and go and get your damn tickets now, okay? <laughs> well, from Cystic for the more further adventures of Dick Lee. Thank you. Ta-da. Don't worry about yeah, it, man. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> done, done. Okay. Hey, producer, better put a shameless plug on too, okay? For the edited version. <laughs> okay. We'll give you the poster. Ah, give you poster too. <laughs> um, okay. We come to this part of the show. Um, this is where I'm going to ask you uh, so, well, more of your opinions. What were your parents like? You said that your mom believed in you. Your dad was disappointed in you when you decided to deliberately flunk your O's. But what were they really like, in your own words? Well, they were opposites. You know, my mom. Uh, my mom was very lively, very uh, life and soul of the party. Mm. Uh, love singing, dancing, fashion. Yeah. And my father, very staid, very quiet. What did he do for a living, your dad? Uh, my f- grandfather's business was uh, in uh, ship uh, stevedoring, 
Sepi Doring, okay. Sepi Doring, they, they, they were sub, uh, servicing the ships on Pulau Bukom. Okay. And their, their base business was based there. They mm-hmm. unloaded and cleaned the ships and everything. Right. Uh, and that was what my father inherited. And right. And he was working there. And, and I, mommy? I was meant to go in that direction, you see. So if I don't do my own thing. Oh, God forbid, man. Go in the family, <laughs> family business and all that, right? And I'm an eldest grandson and mm. all that. Yeah, so my mom... Uh, she was a nurse uh, wow. when she um, when she came to Singapore. She she was here, born here, then went to Malaysia mm-hmm. during the Second World War mm-hmm. to hide. You know, my her mother put her there, mm-hmm. and then she came back and uh, became a nurse. Uh, and when she then my father was her patient. That's how they met. Very romantic. Wow. Yeah. Are you Pranagan? Yes, my father's side. Yeah. I've always wanted to find out, you know, well, I finally got it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't it? It's quite, I thought it was quite obvious. I, I, I do a people lot of suspect, yeah. People suspect. People uh, suspect. You know, I, I told you I spent the last couple of weeks talking to people, right? Yeah. This is one of the things that people were curious about. He's Dickly Pranakan. I said, I really? think so. Yeah. Oh, he I sounds Pranakan, you know? Very. Yeah, my mom's Pranakan, by the way. I'm oh. actually raised more Pranakan than I was raised Eurasian. Ah, uh, see, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, what would your advice be to parents? of kids who want to be entertainers? Wow, they are all, you know, speaking to all 900,000 of you out there, (laughs) because I do child aid. Okay, yes, Uh, yes. I used to do child aid, and you know, you're dealing with their parents, and and they're very, it's such a different uh, world now. I mean, they, Mm -hmm. I think now you can actually sort of see that that you can have a career. I mean, you know, you can be a K-pop star, whatever it is, I don't know. But, I mean, I- you know, I would be wary. But the thing is that I find they're very supportive of their... Lots of parents right. are very supportive of their their children's ambitions and right. talent. Right. But these would be, you know, more you know, middle class. Sure. So yeah. they're still underprivileged and all that, who, yeah. for whom it's not an option. Right. Um, they have to deal with so many other things right, before um, they, you know, yeah. because it's still perceived as a not really uh, stable, stable career. Stable, yeah. Mm-hmm. Although, luckily nowadays there are artists who have, you know, broken the mold. Mm-hmm. I mean, I might be one of them. Definitely. But in my time, there w- there weren't any. La. Mm-hmm. You know, for me in the seventies to be a musician mm. meant playing in a bar. You know, yep. playing you know in a lounge or yeah. something like that. So it wasn't my. That didn't look attractive to my parents. Yeah, but what would you say to these parents then? I would say definitely encourage them to think out of the box. Okay. Because being creative makes you explore. Right. And they may not end up being a musician, but mm-hmm. they would have, they would end up being able to see more than what they are told to see. Right. And because they've like emulated their heroes, yes. you know, when you sing. You try to sing like, say, you know, Ariana Grande. So mm-hmm. you, you do emulate her. Then you look, find out about her. Right. You you learn to you learn to explore. You learn to discover. You mentioned K-pop just now, interestingly, which you know, so, then something popped up in my head. Do you think does Dick Lee think over the next say decade or so that Singapore will have such a thing called S-pop? We do have S-pop right now, but it's just not maybe. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I am, I am the living embodiment of that, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about you know how the Korean K-pop scene, and then before yeah. that the J-pop scene. Even you were in Japan. You were big in Japan too. Not trying to be funny like Alphaville, but you were, <laughs> you were big in Japan. Yeah. And these, the culture, you know, the entertainment culture and industry in these countries. They're, in part, they're in Asia. They're Asia as well. The grew. Do you think Singapore will ever have that? Uh, not likely, because mm-hmm. um, K-pop has a Korean language. Right. It's a language thing. Our music is in English or Chinese or. Malay but can never be English, lah. Already <laughs> okay. Ban. Can I ban? <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's you know, it's too. I I was a bit of a novelty when I came out. Mm-hmm. And novelty. that is why I was yeah. That is why I was able to go to Japan and have a career there. I was the kind of version of Psy. Oh. You know, Gangnam Style yeah. is a one-hit wonder. Yeah. And it's not really K-pop in the sense... He opened the doors for BTS, right? 
Right. Yeah. But his, if you look at what he did, what he does, it's it's quite jokey, right? It's quite gimmicky. Yeah. yeah. Um, How can you say that you're like Sai? Because the song, the music on on the Mad China Man is all like that. Okay. Rasa Sayang is a rap in Singlish. Right. You know, and Mustafa. You know, is it was. I mean, that album is 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 ex- is a play on all the multicultural uh, mm-hmm, ism mm-hmm. that we yep. I I grew up with. Yeah. But this this combined um, sort of roja was made it unique. Mm-hmm. But you know you you can't do that. I can't even do that anymore. It's like a one time thing. But it it got me out of here and it got mm. me into Japan. Yeah. And it opened the floodgates for Asian pop in Japan. But that being said, Dick, do you then think Singapore is a conducive environment for artists? Our market's too small and we don't have our unique... Um, blend. Ble- no, not blend. Our unique culture. Mm. We don't have it. Could we do something, anything better? What do you think we can do to, to just make sure things get better for artists in Singapore? Now the platform uh, is not here, right? The platform is the world. Yeah. Right? And if you look at the potential for us, for us Singaporeans, what yeah. is the potential? I would say if I'm advising artists, if you're Chinese, go to the Chinese market. If you're Malay, try Malay market, you know. I would do that. And and, mm. and my friends like Shabir are doing Hollywood music, you know. Mm. He, mm. I go to India if you're Indian. Mm. Because how many Indians here enough to support you? Then the poor Eurasians were stuck somewhere now. Mm. Go to <laughs> go to go to Eurasia. <laughs> Eurasia, which is next to Iran and oh, <laughs> Afghanistan gosh. or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, Eurasians are seen as like Western. So I mm. mean, you know, Eurasians can do the West. But you you know, that that, that is a problem. You see, all, all of us have to do with are bigger markets for us. Yeah, out outside of this country. Yeah. What is your advice to kids then who want to become a dick Lee? You want to be a dick. Kids want to be a, Don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. Be a dick Lee. Okay, so... Um, I think that... Every, I mean, everybody should strive to be... To, to, to develop their creativity. I would encourage parents... You know, and I have many friends with young children and they're so afraid for their kids because... They're going through this school. They are so, they are so struggling with their exams and mm, all that. And mm. their whole world becomes like that. They become very narrow-minded. Yeah. And yeah. I would say it's very important to you know expand their horizons and and think out of the box. From a young age. From very young. From prime. The minute they go into school, give show them the alternatives. You know. Okay. Ex- uh, and like, show them different things r- rather than what only they like. You know, I got I got I got to share with you this experience I've had. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, mm. for a primary school, my son's primary school, mm. my old alma mater, I was invited. How old? To, no. Uh, how, how, how primary what? No? My son is going to be P six next year, but back then I think this was two, three years ago. So he was in P three, or something like that, and and I stand on two industries uh, as a veteran. Um, so I decided to, to, to do, they, had, they had this career thing going on for primary school kids, which is quite amazing. And they had the P6s going on. I just introduced them to the commercial world. Mm. So you had your RSAF guy who's a dad, you know, uh, Air Force pilot, and you've got all kinds of people set up booths. And I set up mine with a microphone. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That. And, but you know what? I had kids who come up and said, this is not a real job. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have kids who come up and said, you can't, m- you can't make money doing this. And I asked him, who told you that you can't make money doing this? Mom and dad. <laughs> they have yeah. this Filipino boy who, uh, who, who, who's, you, you know, parents came here uh, to work and he's in the school. And he said, I play the guitar. I said, that's great. Then the rest of them looked at him as if you're an alien. Mm. You know, and it, he felt so sheepish. You know, really? He looked yeah. so sheepish after that. Yeah. That's and bad. and this is yeah this is what's happening you know it's really really sad and I hope so we, this thing will change. It's the parents' attitude, oh. the parents' mindset. They're the first teachers, the kids. Yeah. It's the first teachers. Um, I need I need to. I'm going to close this now because this is where I told you earlier on. I asked you when was it when you spoke to this teacher of yours you played piano with in the UK, mm. and the things he said to you, all the epiphanies you you received. Now I'm beginning to understand what you said mm-hmm. 
in December 1986. Yeah. Let me think back. <laughs> you can't, you, you won't remember. <laughs> Believe me, you won't remember. I'm going to okay. say this because today, this is closure for me. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jake, I'm going to tell you now. In 1986, December, in Metro Lucky Plaza, mm -hmm. a young 16 year old boy saw you. Because that young 16-year-old boy was working for the school holidays in, in, Metro. <laughs> in Metro Lucky okay. Plaza. It's gone now. And Metro Grand, right? Metro Grand, you're yeah. right. And I walked over to you because you were shopping. Oh, you were alone. And I walked over to you. The 16-year-old boy was me. And I asked you. I was so excited. Oh, my God, that's Dick Lee. And I walked over. And I asked you. I said, I'm sorry to disturb you. I never forget this, just like yesterday. But I just need to ask you one thing. What does it take to make it in the music business? And your answer was this. You didn't look at me. You just said, you have to ask yourself whether you have it or you don't. And the way I look at you, you don't. And you walked away. <laughs> Did I say that? And you walked away. Why? I wonder why I would say that. I don't I know. Maybe know. you were shopping and I was bugging you. <laughs> I don't know. I asked that question. Um, when I asked FD that question when I was 14. When I, I actually called him when he was in Rediffusion on show. And I asked that question at 16. And I happened to just, by per chance, saw you. And I came to ask you the same question. Um, no, no, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to thank you. Because, uh, yeah, because after you walked away, I made a decision. That's not true. Mm. I think that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I probably meant no, but you have you mentioned to believe in yourself. Yes, yeah. you, you meant about don't be deluded, be real with who you are. And then you said that just now. Then it occurred to me. Why you, maybe why you said what you did to me in 86 December. Thank you, Dick. Welcome, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing shows with music and was movement I, uh, after that. Oh, really? Oh, oh yes, okay, with yeah, Vimsek. Yeah. But singing, uh, singing? No, uh, hosting. hosting. And singing. I did sing a couple of gigs I did. Yeah. Yeah, with music and movement. And I said, you know what? Does Dick Lee know that I'm here doing it? <laughs> <laughs> so that was when... When was that? That's, I probably was in Japan. 93. Was, yeah, so I was away. Hmm. So I, I didn't, didn't... I was 23 at the time. Yeah, oh, I was 23 okay. at the time. But it's cool because... Um, How did you feel? Hurt. I was, I was. Very hurt. 16, man. I was just a kid, you know. Hurt. But uh, something I never forgot. I even remember where it was, where right. we were standing. In the gents department. In the swimwear department, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can remember buying a swimsuit at Metro. Uh, you were, you were okay. looking at, at swimwear, you were. Um, and, and I guess maybe you were a bit rattled because you're looking at stuff and there this guy comes along and asks you this probably asinine question, you know. Yeah. But uh, here we are. Actually, if <laughs> I'm just thinking about 1986. That was a period, um, that was a very, that was a period of, uh, you know, when I was actually going to give up music. Really? Yeah, because um, in 1984, mm -hmm. in 1984, I released an album, mm -hmm. my second album after Life Story, okay, uh, and Fried Rice Paradise and all of that, right? That was in 19, 1974. I released that. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, I released this album called Life in the Lion City, okay. all about Singapore. And the years that, and it, f it failed miserably because, first of all, no one was interested in Singapore things. Mm -hmm. There was no sense of being Singaporean. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no support. Piracy was rampant. Mm -hmm. no, uh, you could buy a Michael Jackson cassette for yep. $2, yep. but my, album, my cassette is $8. <laughs> so who wants to buy that? So, 84, then I released another couple albums and they all failed. You know, they all didn't, didn't sell. And record company stopped. Um, Mm -hmm. Said I can't, we can't be doing anymore. Mm -hmm. I was very disillusioned f during those period, nineteen eighty six to eighty eight. Okay, 
um, and thinking like, yeah. I caught you at a bad time. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe I was just being real, you know. And I was myself thinking that it's not even worth it. Don't even go into it. You know? But uh, just so you know, uh, you're an icon. You are the son of, you know, Singapore's music. Um, and uh, very highly respected, sir. Uh, I am very glad and honored and proud to have you on KWC. Thank you, Dick, for being Thank here you. with me today. Thank you. Everyone, you've been watching and listening to Dick Lee on Kopi with Chris. I hope you enjoyed this one. Do remember to catch the tickets quickly before they're all sold out for his upcoming show. Uh, rewind a little bit and then see all the details. Eh? After the show is done, you will also see some more uh, details for how you can actually get those tickets. This has been a great time, Dick. Thank you so very much. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane. This is Chris Hansen. Bye-bye. <music>